Folks, hello. Good to see you all coming in. And it's uh, the 228th uh, CG seminar since we began at the end of 2015. Um, and today we've got one about rising stars in higher education studies. Tan Pham with us again, giving her second webinar for the year. And we really look forward to what she has to say about the agentic capital uh, of international graduates. Agentic capital is a concept which she will explain. That's her kind of core concept, I think, in this presentation, you know, during, during, the, uh, during the webinar. Um, before I introduce Tan properly, let me take you through the webinar protocols. Now, remember the webinar is being recorded and will be posted online on the CG website within 24 hours or so. And um, of course, it winds up on YouTube. That's how you view it through our website. And um, we're finding that people are using the YouTube version even more than they're using the um, participation on the day. So that's very welcome. And uh, it means that Tan's words will be forever immortalized as long as there is a YouTube anyway. Um, we also post the uh, trans transcript of the chat as well. So what you say in the chat to everyone will be recorded uh, and, and posted. So keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, please keep yourself muted um, and uh, turn off your video, uh, un unless we've got to the stage where we're in the Q&A and we want to bring you into the discussion. We recommend using the speaker view uh, set setting in Zoom in the top right-hand corner there so you can more clearly see who is talking at any given time. And it's particularly useful when we get into the more broad-based discussion in, in the, uh, the Q&A phase. To ask a question, to come into the Q&A, please put your question or your statement, if it's not a, exactly a question, into the, um, into the chat. Type it into the chat and then I'll know it's there and I'll be able to identify you as the chair and bring you in to the discussion in a sequence. Uh, if you uh, come in fairly early, with your intervention in the chat, and it's relevant to the topic of the webinar, which doesn't always happen, but usually does, then we can bring you into the discussion um, early up and you'll definitely get a, get, get, get a word in. But if you type your comment in late, in the last 10 minutes or so, there's a danger you won't be able to get onto the speaking list, which will be full by that stage. So do keep that in mind. I always say this every week, but people always come in slowly and late. Um, but some wisely come in early, and I advise you to do that if you can. And when we get to the stage of bringing you into the discussion, um, then uh, we'll invite you in by name, and I'll send you a message in the chat before doing so. So, and then I'll invite you in on 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 sound and video. Um, and then you unmute yourself, you switch on your video, and you state your name and where you are from, and then begin. So we look forward to that stage of things, but there's 30 minutes or so between now and then. And uh, that 30 minutes is in, in under full control of uh, Tan Pham. She's a senior lecturer in education at uh, Monash University in Australia. Her research interests are in higher education, graduate employability and internationalization. And she's currently researching on how international graduates in different contexts, including Australian and um, Asian countries like Japan and Vietnam and China and Singapore utilize resources obtained in the host country and further de developed in the home countries to navigate labor markets. So she's in very important conjunction of international mobility and the all important issue of labor market experience of graduates. So Tan, the screen is now yours. Tell us all about it. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Uh, so let me share the screen. Okay, so thank you so much, Simon. And you um, thank you. Yeah, can you see the slides? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything looks okay. Yeah. Looks good. Okay, yeah. So thank you so much, Simon, and thank you so much, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to uh, my second presentation. And uh, today I make an effort on to, um, uh, you know, some, uh, make an effort to work on an interesting topic. And for, for me, I say it's interesting, but I'm not so sure if the, um, how you feel uh, after, after the presentation, if it is interesting for you. So today we will talk about unpacking the agentic capitals in the employability of international graduates. 
And um, he has some of the key points. We will go through the presentation. So first we will talk about how much we know about agency. And then we will talk about agency for international graduates employability, including how much we have done in this field and what enables and hinders agentic capitals in international graduates employability. So to, before we talk about agency, I would like to discuss the concept of employability because it will guide our understanding through the presentation. So to, if you look into the, um, the literature about employability, you could see the employability is a contested concept. Uh, different researchers have talked about employability differently, but here are some of the key aspects. Um, uh, many researchers have talked about employability. So employability means employment outcomes, job satisfactions, professional skills growth, well-being, and sustainability. And my research is very much about sustainability because I argue for the fact that it is important for graduates to obtain their job, but it is also equally important for them to sustain their job and their career. So now how much we have known about agency. Agency has uh, gained considerable attention of researchers in different fields, including the student learning and workplace learning and sociology, et cetera. However, the concept of agency has remained relatively vague and abstract because different researchers have offered different ways to argue for the fact that what agency should be. In the field of international students, we already know that the dominant approach in this field is that um, we see international students as someone to, who, who need to make adjustments and who needs to make adaptations in the host labor market. And um, here's IU Chanas and Young, uh, the conceptual framework as an example to illustrate this perspective. And it is only recently that we have more and more researchers starting to look into agency of international students. For example, in, um, in their studies, we have work done by Martinson and Junt and colleagues and some other researchers. And in employability, it, it is still very limited. It is really hard to find some um, uh, research purely talking about agency and international graduates employability. We have some work done by Robert, uh, Junt and colleagues. And uh, recently, I, uh, um, I done some to work in this field. But I have to acknowledge, I have to acknowledge um, my work in this field is still limited. So the presentation today will actually elaborate and further explain what I have published so far. And hopefully in coming years, in a few years, I will have more contributions in this field because now that I have completed my empirical uh, research study and I am doing the writing in this field. So to, because of limited research in this field, we, uh, we have a range of different questions still to remain unanswered. For example, so what constitutes international graduates um, agency and to what are the strategies they develop and utilize to negotiate their employability? On those in the current literature, so we have some strategies like needs response agency or agency for becoming and the interlinked capital. And some other questions like what makes some graduates more or less agentic and what is the relationship between agency and the labor market. And if agencies are static and fluid, those questions still remain unanswered. And my result actually aims to answer some of these questions. So about my research, I, um, as I already said in my first presentation in April, for the last few years, I have done uh, some research studies about graduate employability, especially international graduate employability. And I have used both mixed uh, methods and qualitative and some of the conceptual and theoretical frameworks I have used and I am still trying to learn to use, including both two Tomlinson graduate models, Marginson self-formation and ascent capabilities and um, activity theory. So the empirical findings in this present uh, in these presentations came from the different research projects, and in total, uh, participants included 80 international graduates, and 54 of them were from Asian countries, and 26 were from other countries. 
And uh, regarding the methods, it is purely qualitative, including narrative and biographical interpretive methods and scope back methodology, because these methods allow for an understanding of the dynamic nature of the relationship between structures and agency. Now, so before I share the findings of my uh, study, I would like to discuss some key literatures and key concepts about agency so that we can uh, have like, like the background to understand um, the findings of my research. So what is agency? Uh, as I shared at the beginning of my presentation, agency has received considerable um, uh, attention of researchers in different fields. And to make it clear and straightforward, easy for us to understand, I synthesize literatures into two chains. The first one um, is a human agency, or some other researchers call them um, authentic features or authentic characteristics. And here I use authentic features. And there is a range of different authentic features that researchers argue should belong to authentic features. Uh, but here are some key authentic features. The first one is agency competence. Um, agency competence refers to the capacity or the ability to visualize desired futures or um, future goals. And it is also about self regulations and the knowledge to know the preferences and capacities. And the second one is agency beliefs. That is the belief in being able to engage in goal-directed behaviors and self-initiated. Self and also about how to um, be able to exercise control over their lives and also the environment. And it is also about the agency personality and some researchers cause the proactivity. So it is about the tendency to take goal on um, oriented, oriented behaviors to bring about change for oneself and for the communities, for the environment. And it is also about the capacity to decide how much one to, wants to, to participate fully, partially, or entirely not participate. And the second change is not about authentic features, but authentic actions. And here are some um, authentic actions that the literatures have discussed. The first one is actively engaging. So that is the action that people make based on the analysis of their past experiences and their imaginations and their, their, their um, uh, predictions of the future. And a note here is without active engagement, we will tend to follow the, the habits, their habits, and this then holds them from engaging with the present possibilities. And the second authentic uh, action is actively selecting. That is about how people to decide how to and the extent to which they want to participate and how they fight and evaluate and select actions. And it's also about how they reflect about the abilities and preferences. And it is also about actively learning. So it is about the, um, how people deliberately make efforts to learn so that they can improve professionally and personally, and how they seek uh, feedback to make um, uh, improvements for, uh, for their performance, and how they volunteer to take responsibilities. And the last one, it is about actively initiating. So that means how people actively um, initiate changes, uh, share suggestions, ideas, and also how they make people aware of the, um, the issues in the communities or surrounding. So that these two chains, the uh, authentic features and authentic actions are not separated, but connected. And uh, the predominant perspective seeing the connection between these two chains is like this. Authentic feature leads to authentic actions and then outcomes. For example, so if you believe in winning a job, then the authentic actions you tend to take to would be preparing CV or practice um, interview and to buy new clothes. Some people buy new clothes before preparing CV and practice um, interview to have more motivation. And the outcomes would be the failed or success. And another important thing is we can't understand agency without considering the, stru the structure. So uh, um, with those structures, we, we can't know, we, we, we can't measure uh, how one is more authentic or less authentic. And we can understand how the individuals develop and utilize their strategies to negotiate or to interact with the structure. So to understand agency, we need to have something like this, the structures, agencies, and individuals. 
Now, regarding the structures in different fields, we have the different structural factors that people have to deal with, people have to interact with. And in the field of employability of international graduates, here are the common structural factors that international graduates usually need to interact with and need to deal with. So at the society level, it is about a highly competitive labor market. Australian labor market is known as very highly competitive and it is about a valid visa. So the very common international graduates need to have valid visas when they apply for a job. And it is about discrimination. It's a very common issue that we already know in research and social media. And at the workplace, it is about employers' expectations, mentorships, supervisions, material resources, and working culture. So when we talk about structural factors, usually we think that structural factors as constraints, but actually in many cases, structural factors can be affordances. So how people interpret um, and perceive the structural factors as constraints or the affordances actually is largely depending on what I call individual resources. It is about knowledge, it is about skills and experiences. So, to, um, for example, to, if you experience um, discrimination and you have experience about discrimination in the past, you would have skills and knowledge uh, to deal with discrimination. So to, you would know to how to deal or manage discrimination better than those people would now experience about discrimination. So individual resources, um, to some extent, to a great extent, informed individuals how they interact and how they perceive structural factors. So to, if they transform the structures or resist the structures, we, we call them, or they, they are seen as agentic. And to, if they agree to, or they accept the structures, they do not do transformations or resist the structures. They are seen as non-agentic. So I have discussed some of the key literatures and key concepts about um, uh, agency and some of like the conceptual frameworks. So hopefully they will um, help us understand the findings of my research. So now so the data analysis of my research reviewed two groups or two stages. And I will explain to why I call stages uh, at the end of the presentation. The first one was non-agentic groups or non-agentic stage. And there was some evidence showing uh, this group or at this stage, um, these graduates was non-agentic. The first one was that they lack confidence and beliefs in securing their design job. For example, so one said, I apply for fund in it because the positions require local knowledge and excel excellence English. I knew I will fail to even before I apply. So this graduates acknowledge that he had um, limited uh, local knowledge and um, excellence English. So uh, he, he knew he would, he would fail to, uh, before he applied for the job. And the second graduate said, um, although he had an MA degree, but he, he was not confident if he was given a high position because he accepted the fact that he had limited knowledge in this field. And the third graduate, is, um, uh, he won a job at a big four. Big four is a big company in Australia. But then he, he, he treated the success as like a nice surprise because he never thought he would secure a job at a big four. And the second themes coming from this group or at this stage was that the graduates lack of goal-directed goal behaviors in managing their career. For example, so one said, I did a job because I had nothing to do. And I am doing three or four different jobs and I feel that for every job I have something to end, I lack something. Mm -hmm. So the sense of the having unclear um, uh, goal-directed um, behaviors or the unclear futures is something common amongst international graduates and international students. For example, Marchinson uh, discussed international students having plural identities and space possible. So for them, they have more, more than one identity and for them, things are possible, but not definite. Or so, um, Revit uh, talking about uh, cultural uncertainties and confusions, that's something very common to international students have to face. 
So to what do these calls tell us about the positions of these graduates in relation to the structure? First, they tell us that these graduates were too willing to accept that they had limited capitals. For example, the human, social, and cultural. In terms of human capital, it is especially support those with occupations not well connected to their prior expertise. Because of the fact that a number of international graduates enrolled in some disciplines um, only because that area was on the high demanding. So they, they did the studies for the sake of visa. So to, if they even if they are lucky to have jobs in that um, area, so they, uh, they, they, they do not really feel confident about their expertise. And about cultural capital, it is especially for those with little real life and work experience. And it is something like I shared in some of the course just before. And secondly, this goal tells us the fact that these graduates perceive structural factors at norms and standards, and they could do little about it. So at the, uh, at the result, they let the situation decide how lucky or unlucky they would be. So if we put what we have about these groups in the frameworks we have established, it would look like this. So for these groups, the individual's resources would be limited uh, capitals like human and cultural and unclear about futures and lack real life and work experience. And because of this, the, um, their individual resources informed how they interact with the structure. For this group to end at this stage, or at this stage, they, they perceive structural factors mainly as constraints, and they could do little about the structure. So, to, um, so for this case, we can use some uh, theoretical uh, and conceptual frameworks to explain, for example, like uh, for both tools uh, in terms of um, the ideas about domination and habitus. He said um, uh, in the field, uh, different groups dominate or are dominated based on the capitals they possess. And um, so for, for this group and or at this stage, these, these graduates, they accepted the fact that they have limited capitals. So they, um, uh, the, uh, they accepted their like inferior positions in the societies or in the labor market. And it is also about, about habitus. So the graduates, they carry with them the perception that the, the labor market, the host labor market is highly competitive. And the employer's expectations was um, uh, like they have high expectations and they could not meet the expectations of the local the industries. Also, we can um, refer to the, con uh, to the concept um, of cultural fit um, developed by Woods and colleagues and discussed in Martinson and colleagues' work. So to, uh, for these graduates or at this stage, they perceive that they need to fit into the host labor market and they, uh, they need to fit into the host society. So now let's move to the second group or the, uh, the, the second stage. Um, that is the agentic group or the agentic stage. So for this group or at this stage, they know how to tap into the ethnic capitals. So for example, so one graduate say, um, this one to form a narrative. So she was not confident about her English and cultural knowledge. So she always targeted to um, apply for uh, some companies that allow her to use Vietnamese. And eventually, it's actually, she got a job at a multinational company. So in this case, this graduates knew how to use ethnic community as a target space for jobs. Or this graduates are saying that he did a job at a Chinese company. And after that, he felt confident and he applied for a job at an Australian corporate because he wanted to try new things. So these graduates knew how to use ethnic community as a springboard for, to transform his future. And another graduate saying that's why she did nothing because uh, she, uh, she knows how to uh, use ethnic symbolic capitals at a, uh, as an advantage. And the last one, it showed us these graduates know how to use ethnic networks to find the appropriate career pathways. And the second theme to coming from to this group or at this stage was that they knew how to navigate the systems based on their real life and to work experiences. Um, this code is a little bit too long, to, but um, the idea to was that this graduate, um, she first um, not confident or got panicked um, about attending the meeting and also organized the, um, an event for her students. 
only because she did not have real experiences in doing those things. And when she actually did um, the, these things, try these things, she found out that actually it was not that difficult and she became more confident. So real life experiences make people more confident and aware of the techniques to go about structural barriers. And this group or this, at this stage, they also had a desire to transform oneself and others. For example, this graduate, he said he committed to improve English, not only because of the sector of finding a job in Australia, but also because he wanted to, to improve himself. And um, another graduate saying that she opened her business because um, she wanted to help her friend. And for this group or at this stage, um, I also found they deliberately look for useful and supportive mentor mentorship uh, at the workplace and also beyond their workplace. And the final themes coming from this group was that some graduates shows their uh, resistance or they resisted the structural factors like expectations of the organizations or job requirements. And they have different reasons. Uh, the first one was that some graduates, they, um, they, they, they had other priorities like family and kids. For example, some graduates saying that um, they did not want to become a perfectionist for their careers or um, at the workplace, only because they wanted to share their time with their kids and looking after their family. Or some graduates saying that they refused the job offers only because they did not want to travel to other states and they wanted to spend time with their family. And some other graduates, they, um, they show that they did not have insights to see the values of the work. So because they did not see the values, they, uh, the, uh, and only because they did not have insights, so they did not support the way that the organization did things. And some other graduates showing that they had insight experiences, but they saw the mismatch between their insight experiences and the work. And some others, they, they had intentions to do the work, but they did not have enough structural resources to support their initiatives. So similar to the first group, if we put what we have um, about this group in the, the conceptual framework we established, it would be uh, like this. So individual resources of this group to um, include ethnic capitals, cultural capital, design to transform oneself and others, and mentorship, et cetera. And these individuals' resources informed how they interact with the structure. So um, for this group, they perceived or they, 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 um, uh, they, they treat um, structural factors, not only as constraints, but also affordances and mainly in terms of forces or motivation for them to do transformations or resist the structure. So um, some of the relevant theory code and uh, conceptual uh, notions we can use to explain to, uh, for these situations includes a sense of capability in terms of the freedom and agency. We talk about how people make choices based on um, what they value or margins and self-formation talking about different people that have diverse resources and make different choices. And when they make choice, choices, not only because of like their work or their study, but also because they want to improve themselves. Or the ancestors, um, uh, expensive learning, the notions about expensive learning, he emphasizes the fact that contradictions can be the potentials for innovations and renovations. And here for this group or at this stage, one thing we also need to note is, as we see from the evidence, it is not always from the authentic features leads to authentic actions, but it uh, it can be all, also the other um, the other way around. It is a form of authentic actions lead to authentic feature. So um, based on the, the findings um, I have discussed now, that we come to the, 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 the core idea about authentic uh, capital. So for me, to, if we use the terms agency, um, when we talk about employability of international, international graduates, um, it is somehow confusing and something missing. Uh, because if we use agency, the people can think it uh, can be either a authentic feature or authentic actions. And um, uh, I would think many people, many people, we in um, like majorities, we would think it is about authentic feature. 
So the, perhaps the, the, the terms authentic capital is a better weight and authentic capital here is the combination between authentic features and authentic actions. And these two things interact with each other uh, to print about employability outcomes. And when we talk about employability, employability outcomes, we need to talk about employment outcomes and other aspects. Because as I just explained, we can understand employability without considering and understanding the other aspects. So that is something that I would think um, makes sense for me to, and based on the findings of my studies. And the findings of my uh, research also inform some of the concepts about authentic features and uh, authentic actions that we are see uh, seeing in the literature so may need to revise to, um, to make them more appropriate and suitable in the case of international students. For example, so the concept about authentic actions. So we say authentic actions means um, active engagement and people make actions based on their analysis um, of their, their past experiences to learn from past experiences. But then in the case of the international students and international graduates, especially when we talk about their work experiences, they usually have very limited work experiences. So if we ask them to analyze their work experience in the past and learn, it will be a little bit struggling for them. So how do we, do we, we make sense of past experiences in the case of employability for international students? These concepts need to be revised and how I am still thinking. And also about future. So do we uh, hear the future, that means we ask them to think of imagine and to predict and then make plans for their future. But in the case of international students, um, they can make the plans for short term, but it's uh, quite tricky for them to make uh, plans for long term. Because as I just uh, discussed in previous slides, for them futures, um, for many of them, the future are vague, futures are uncertain. So how to make long term plans and then to work out like a gold, um, uh, now, oriented behaviors or plans for international students is a little bit struggling. And also for the, for the concept about the, uh, actively selecting. So here the clearly it's formed my findings. Actively selecting here also needs to be about how, to, um, how did they utilize and um, their ethnic capital selectively. So this concept needs to be added here. So here are just a couple of examples about how to we, 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 we think some of the concepts we are seeing in the literature need to be revised to make sense and make it more appropriate in the case of international students. So now some key takeaways messages based on um, the findings I am having in my research. So some people can be more authentic than others, but it is more about how people engage in authentic actions to build their authentic capital. And authentic capital is not fixed, but a fluid and a fluctuating depending on personal and contextual factors and the level of interactions between individual and his context. Now, so I would like to explain the concept about stage before I say like group or stage, because in my studies, I um, did not see it, um, uh, many graduates, very few stage belong to one of the two groups permanently. Most of them uh, move around, some were agentic and then to become non agentic and some other non agentic and agentic. So that's why agentic capitals was not fixed, but fluctuated. And um, messages that take away for international students, I would say they need to analyze strengths, weaknesses, and priorities by themselves and others, especially uh, if they have good mentors. And they need to engage in real life practices and reflect on real life practices because they are crucially important, especially to build a cultural capital. And they should be selective. And to be selective, sometimes they need to be less ambitious because I see the international students doing well, but many are very ambitious. So when they are too ambitious, the space to be selective is usually um, limited. So um, that's all for the presentations. And um, I would love to have a questions from the all of you. So, yeah, thank you. Well, thanks, Tan. Um, there's a lot in there, and um, I've got a couple of questions, and I think that some questions are beginning to come through now from Doria and Fenella already. So, folks, um, 
think about your questions now come forward in the chat and uh, we'll be able to bring you into the discussion let me start on with my questions then tan um okay here's two first up and i'll ask you a third one as well subsequently if that we've got time um when people are building agentic capital you say so you say it fluctuates uh the agentic capital itself uh experience plays a role in this <clears throat> can i ask you to reflect on the respective roles of experience and imagination you know in building this agenda capital and then also in um imagining or, or or visualizing future trajectories that's my first question experience and imagination how do they inter interplay second question is about knowledge um because of related work that i'm doing at the moment in in self-formation of academic self-formation um i'm asking this the role of knowledge in building agenda capital how does do graduates use what they've learned now that can be specific you know in terms of particular skill bases and so on professional work or it can be more general you know it can be uh how um their greater knowledge of science or or the use of language you know has assists them how, how do they use knowledge in building agentic capital so there's three things really there's the role of experience the role of imagination and the role of knowledge yeah thank you so much simon so very interesting and very important questions yeah, so for me, to, um, experience and Im imagination, and you mentioned how to, those things can uh, related to uh, like um, authentic capitals and um, in the ways that are uh, fluctuated. Um, uh, uh, for international students, um, uh, as I said, uh, so imagination, they imagine their futures and um, agree that on the way, to, uh, how they plan for their futures can change. Because um, they imagined uh, today's like this, but then if they have experience and then the contextuals, they have different contextual factors, the surrounding to happen, and then their imaginations could, um, uh, could, could change. So they, they need to work on to like continuing changing to their futures, their, their plans to work out how they, 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 they manage their life and they manage their career. So by that way, their imagination and experiences could influence the ways they build their authentic capitals. And in that way, their authentic capital fluctuates as well. And in terms of knowledge, um, so the, the, how to, um, from, from what I seen from, from, from um, this project in terms of agency and um, other to work about uh, capitals, I, I could say that how students build their knowledge would influence the ways that how they, they perceive and they interact with the society. That means the ways they interact with the, the, the structure. So knowledge, um, um, like if we, we think about knowledge as the hack currencies or like expertise, yes, definitely, definitely it, uh, it plays a, an important role in the ways that the students build authentic capital. So that, that's what I am thinking. I'm not so sure if I answered your questions well enough to, or if you want to question me again or you, you would like to add more insight about it. Uh, you, you, you mute yourself, uh, Simon. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, I think those sorts of questions require specific, you know, empirical inquiry to, to start to unlock them. But um, let me ask my, my other question. Um, now, you've been researching employability of graduates for a while. Can I ask you to reflect in an Australian context on the difference between the experience of graduates in public sector employment and non-public sector or private sector employment? I mean, um, I, mean I asked this partly because I researched in this area a lot, some time ago in Australia myself, and I wondered if things have changed. but my impression then was that in the public sector in government employment there were protocols which i think provided more surety or guarantee of non-discriminatory practices at the point of selection and on the whole more culturally diverse and gender diverse uh groups were being selected in the public sector as distinct from the private sector so there's the question of discrimination that comes is part of my question but there are other differences between public and private sector. Have you noticed differences? 
Um, yeah, so uh, one of the things that I noticed very clearly it is about the, the, um, uh, the connections with industries and uh, the practical aspects between the public and non-public. So the, um, one of the, the, the projects I am working toward uh, one colleague um, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, we talk about uh, how to, um, like important industry engagement for the uh, graduate employability, and it is clear that for the non-public, usually the connections between the university colleges and industry is better, and also they focus more on the, like vocational aspects or practical practices. So when graduates uh, go out to the labor market uh, from these colleges and uni universities, they are like more advantage in terms of the, these two areas. And um, for the, the, the public universities and, and, and colleges, yes, that, that is something to um, disadvantage them, but then they have other aspects about like uh, the reputations of universities and rep uh, reputations of the colleges. Yes, so it is about pro and cons. Okay, thanks for that. Now, the first uh, of our Q&A participants uh, is Doria. Doria Ab Abdullah, can you come in, Doria? Hi, Prof. Simon. Uh, hi, Prof. Uh, Tan. Um, thank you for your presentation. I actually followed your presentation from the last session that you had with NUS a few weeks before. So this question has been with me for quite some time. Now, uh, based on your uh, findings, uh, do you find uh, teams related to international students um, wanting to go back to their home countries and contribute uh, to their uh, local communities uh, in the home countries. Um, I think uh, we have to acknowledge the fact that employability doesn't just mean working in home, uh, the host country, uh, and especially so for uh, developing nations, uh, we need to think about um, contribu contribution in terms of uh, employability at home uh, countries. Perhaps if you could, uh, comment on that, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, Dorias. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, um, that, that's why um, uh, my research in this field, I cover both um, employability in the host and in the home country. And the presentation today is I talk about agency it only for those graduates uh, stating a stay trying to stay in the host country, but not those um, uh, who plan to, uh, to return to the home country or like agencies of returnees. So the, uh, I agree, if we talk about agency the of the, um, graduates as returnees, you know, some of the, the, the concepts and some of the evidence would look different. And um, you asked me the, how I think about like students need to, to return to their home countries. Yes, um, it is uh, actually is about like some of them because of the scholarship, because of the bond of the country, and some of them because of their choice. And my research about um, returnees, um, uh, uh, recently I published um, uh, this year's yes, on higher education, I think this year's or last year, can't remember exactly. And um, the, uh, the, the evidence was there that uh, like, uh, large numbers of the, uh, graduates in Australia is already to return to their home country, especially in China. We have like 80%, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so to, um, that, that's what I got from my research. Yeah, so not so sure if that's what you expect me to, to answer. Yeah, thank you. I, I suppose uh, reading your paper and follow up after that will be the best option. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tam, and rest well after this, this like, I think 12 for 43 a.m. at your place, I assume. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Doria. Um, we uh, now bring in Fenella. Are, are you there, Fenella Somerville? Yes, I am. Thanks. If you don't mind, I'm going to leave camera off because of bandwidth. Um, but uh, thank you. I already, um, Simon, your questions uh, touched on uh, uh, part of what I was asking. Um, Tim, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just was interested in, um, in the presentation, I just got a sense that a lot of it was dependent on the individual, the individual agency that already possibly pre-existed um, and on being driven by the individual. I wasn't, and I just wondered the extent to which um, their higher education had played a role in the development of that agency, um, whether it be their, their general experience in higher education or their particular 
um, field of study and possibly even the extent to which the institution, you, you mentioned briefly just now about institutional reputation, um, the extent to which the institution had played a role in contributing to that agency. Hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Felinat. Um, and I, uh, yes, I, I agreed. Um, uh, the, the agency, it is like pull and push by both individuals and contextual factors. And I have to explain uh, more um, about the fact that for my project um, up to this stage, I mainly focus on analyzing so from the individual's resources. So that, that means I, I look into the individual, individual resources, mainly not about like the impacts of like um, the structural factors or like the resources around on those the resources definitely is uh, important so the, it it may be like the next um, um papers and when i do more an analysis of the data so it's like the, the uh, structural factors will be the clearer and maybe i have something to share more about that aspect and in terms of your questions about like the role of higher education or universities, based on what I have had so far from the analysis of the findings, I would say that higher education, so they, they should, um, uh, um, uh, one of the things clear, clearly is that they can help the students to enhance their agency it is how to create opportunity for them to gain real life experiences, to build cultural capital, because uh, like similar to what I presented in my first presentation, uh, cultural capitals uh, just like em emerge as a very important factor for the graduate employability and also the, in the ways that help them to build agency. So like one of the, the calls I shared here today, like um, uh, international graduates in many cases, they, they felt not confident. They felt uh, like they could not do things uh, only because they carried with them the image that the labor market in Australia was very competitive and um, university uh, or um, industries have uh, like high expectation. But when they had chance to do the real life practices, they discover that some of the things actually they could do and they could navigate the structure. So the, how to enhance like opportunity for them to do internships and play Placements and you know connect to wood industry. So that's something to higher education to could help. Yeah, so that's something to I I could share to at this stage. Our next uh, question comes from Sayong Lee. Sayong. Thank you, Dr. Pham. Thank you so much for your presentation. It helped my research a lot, your organization and your idea about um, agency and your review, it was amazing. Um, so my question was actually answered by Fanala, but I've got another question. So were there any diff disciplinary differences in agentic capital, in the development of agentic capital in your data? And what about the role of mobility? Because you studied international students and their mobility, was, was there any impact of mobility on students' agentic capital or any influences? Um, hi, see Young. Yeah, congratulations on your presentation last time. <laughs> yes, I, I couldn't attend directly, but I watched uh, later. Um, uh, actually, I am not very clear so what what you really want to to, to know so about agentic capital and mobility. So, um, uh, so Young, can you like uh, clarify it a little bit more so that I can answer correctly? So I don't want to uh, give you a know, wrong answer. Yeah, it might be For more example, than one answer, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you can give like like an example for examples and then i can um answer <laughs> sorry um so my question about the influence of dis maybe it's um similar to simon's question about the role of knowledge in student mm -hmm. agency and agency capital because maybe students in different disciplines would have I don't know, develop different extent of agentic capitals or individual resources and maybe different society, social, social structure and working experiences. Yeah, that. Okay, okay. Okay, I, I got it now. So, yeah, yeah. Clearly, it's, um, uh, be, uh, be, between the disciplines, um, so um, so young, yeah, clearly the different. So the, some graduates are formed like um, uh, what I call like STEM uh, disciplines, 
when to, uh, like engineering, uh, I saw from my data as evidence about those uh, graduates formed uh, like engineering or IT. So when they graduate, they 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 more they were more confident about their expertise, their their technical knowledge because their technical knowledge is more connected to their um their job, their occupation because they can transfer. But for those graduates of forms like um, ACT and um, like um, social science, like uh, business too, when they went out to the labor market, many graduates, they was not confident with that. So that is about authentic feature. So they, they was not confident about the expertise because of the gap between what they learned from the university and the labor market could be larger compared to with those students in the STEM disciplines. So clearly there was different. But if they, uh, you ask me about like different and context, yes, um, like I answer uh, Fenner, if we look into authentic capital between the, those graduates stay in the host countries and return to their home countries, I'm sure there, 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 there are some differences, but I haven't done like authentic capital for returnees, so I can't uh, comment like how different they would look like, yeah, makes sense. Mm. Yeah. There's some something very binary about the whole labor market experience, and there's sort of two sides. There's the there's the graduate, their attributes, how they behave, how they plan and think, what their strategy is in relation to application, and then projecting their their capabilities and so on at the point of selection. But there's also the selection process. You know, there's the other side of the coin. There's the way in which um, selection can. Uh, human resource managers who make culling decisions on applications and then selection committees uh, resolve the question of who they hire. Mm. Uh, and, um, you know, sometimes it seems to me that an interview, which I think it's a very flawed way of selecting people, is like a kind of um, scripted play where, you know, the, the selection committee knows what the, the script is. They're mm. going to go through a set of questions and, they, and they're going to call up behaviours which seem to fit their expectations and their needs and usually mm -hmm. it's their expectations actually not, not, not much not really the ultimate contribution the graduate could make but just what they think that contribution could be so it's quite scripted in their minds and then the if the graduates sort of got the cultural capital in this particular situation uh they'll come out with the right lines at the right time and they'll hit all the right buttons and so on so it's this game you know this kind of simulated dramatic performance game. Um, now, what that raises for me is the relationship between agentic capital and what employers want and expect and you know have in mind and so on, what their notion of the capital is. Have you looked mm -hmm. at the other side, the selection side? Is there a relationship that you can detect between variations in agentic capital and what employers want? I mean, in other words, have you designed yet a, a a way of thinking about agentic capital, which allows you to predict or to shape possible outcomes. Um, yes, uh, Simon said you give me ideas for my next project. Actually, mm, but I, I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> But I have some evidence to to, uh, to share. Um, the, uh, very interesting to, uh, from the, what I saw from my data, as, um, uh, some international graduates, um, it, it, it is very tricky when we say, that usually we think like people they have agency and like confident um, would do better um, in the labor market or like um, would uh, respond to the needs or the expectations of the employers and the industry better. But then in um, uh, some cases, it showed the other way because um, some graduates saying that when they work for the company, yes, they, they, um, they expect them to, to like ask a lot to be confident. But when they ask a lot and show their confidence, it shows like they go to the other extremes of the, on the continuum. So then it can bounce them back, you know, so it's not like fit in, but actually it's like bounce them out of the system. So it is about like authentic in this way, it's not about like confidence, but it also about like how you be, be like flexible and you need to respond to like the contextual of um, the structures in the way that like different systems to work differently. And one of the things um, in my recent publications about communications, um, competencies, I found one thing to, uh, crucially important. 
um, the, 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 that thing was that uh, compared to what, um, like amongst the graduates, those with the real life experiences and have like um, reflective and like deep observations, usually they develop the strategies to navigate the labor market better, only because when they observed and they add like details about like daily practices, they know like how people need, what people need, and they respond in the way that work for them. So the real life practices and being observants really helped when mm -hmm. they go out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the I still think the the best work I've read about graduate hiring is the Laura Rivera stuff. You know, the book pedigree and the papers that went into that, which came out about five six years ago, and that was a really kind of a bit scary in, in the way that it showed that elite um, hiring in the U.S. hiring into mm -hmm. um, banks and um, banks in the banks in the finance sector and law. Um, you know, top law, law appointments and uh, consulting, how mm. stereotyped the, the the decisions were, and, you know, how was who you were, what kind of person you were, kind of mm. preset the whole outcome, really. Uh, mm. And then the interview was about you making the right noises at the right time to show you were that kind of person. And maybe yeah. it was that last, this, you know, level of discrimination between similar looking or similar, similar types of people. Um, mm. You know, you don't need, need to be, need me, me to spell out what those, types were i'm sure you can imagine it um but you know it does show how important the hiring side is of this whole problem and we throw all of the emphasis on the graduates of course and because it's the thing we, which was within reach of us as educators but but you know what what's happening on the selection side is so in, instrumental here now we've got uh xiaoxi li and we've got kathy huang coming through so let's bring in xiaoxi first sorry to keep you waiting xiaoxi hi no problem uh thanks sam uh, and uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Chan, for your very interesting presentation. I've been following your research since it's very closely related with my PhD thesis. And uh, I have a one question about your framework of agentic capital. Uh, and also, I think you, you touched a bit on uh, Purdue's uh, concept of uh, habitus. But actually, uh, I, I also read some research about uh, when they apply in Purdue's theory, they also use the concepts of uh, uh, capital and field. And I think the, the concept of, of capital in produce theory is similar to individual resources in your gentle capital theory. So I, I wonder uh, how would you see the role of inequality in your framework of agentic capital? Is agentic capital related or affected by uh, the social class of the students? And uh, how do you, to what extent do you think agentic capital can contribute to breaking the social reproduction? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Celsius. Yes, um, so the, in terms of your question, the, the first one about um, different social classes. Um, yes, definitely, it's a different graduates in my research where we are coming from the different backgrounds. They, they have different types of the, um, uh, capitals and um, the, they become like more advantage or more disadvantage in the, the labor market. For example, um, some um, some graduates like uh, like, like this. But the, my research, I have to touch on the aspect about returnees again to make it clear. So um, a number of the international graduates, when uh, in international students, when they come to the the, um, the host country. Um, and they already have their networks in the, in the home country. So they come to get a degree, but they don't actually have to worry about their career because they already have networks in the home country, but like their families, their relatives, uh, so they have social network. So in that case, they, of course, like they become more advantage compared to what those students who do not have that, that kind of social network. So that is an example about like different students coming from different backgrounds and having different capitals. Yeah, that makes sense. And your second part, the questions about how capitals contribute to break the, break, yeah, the, break the concept about reproductions. Am I correct? in um for the for, for for that idea yeah so um now here that is a very interesting questions and i do have the evidence but now i have to think to where it is um 
So to, um, can I use the, the ideas about uh, authentic capital? That is one of the capital too, okay? So, um, so the, here, um, uh, the, uh, so the, uh, from the data that I shared here today, um, I touch on the, the ideas about ha uh, habitats, right? So when the international graduates, they did not have the experience and they only um, have the, what they learned from universities and from the, like what they observed from the society. They carry with them the ideas that the labor market is competitive the, and like um, industries have high expectations. And we hear like if you did not have your job to, and you hear it from your friends, you would hear a lot of people talking about like if you apply for these jobs, you have to be like excellent and perfect for your English. And the, you carry that idea that becomes your habitat and you would become not very confident when you apply for the job. But when you, um, uh, you, you, you do not have the job and if you, you give up and then that is the other side, that means you do not like uh, demonstrate you have like a strategy or agency. But then some students, when they, do, they think they do not meet that kind of expectations, they use their ethnic capital. So to, like uh, what I shared in my studies, some of them use the networks of, of their community to find find out so which career pathways is more possible for them. And if you want to know more about this, I would invite you to read my recent publications about competencies and communications. I talk about how like, international graduates navigate you know, the, the structure, the labor market, uh, based on what they think about their communication competency. So the, if they, they, they go the other ways, they develop other strategies to navigate. So that is an example about authentic capitals and how they go about the structure. So hopefully that makes sense. Thank you. Mm. Thanks, Tan. Um, and, and thank you too, Shashi. Good question. Uh, let's, uh, let's bring in as our last question for the webinar, uh, Kathy Huang. Kathy. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Pan. Thanks for your presentation. I would like to ask how to measure the agentic features of participants during your research. And also another question, uh, what is the meaning of the agentic belief? Is that the same with self-efficacy? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Katie. Um, for my research, I did not attempt to measure um, authentic features or like authentic um, belief, the agency belief. Uh, but if you to look into literature's um, um, majority coming from um, um, cognitions and psychology, they have a lot of things about how to measure the authentic features and authentic um, self-efficacy and you know, the, um, agency competence. And I, I have seen uh, like quite a number of the, um, uh, like uh, surveys, uh, items they developed to measure those um, um, uh, um, dimensions. So uh, I would encourage to you to look into those things. And yes, agency belief and self-efficacy, many cases, they are the same actually. Yeah. And, and I was going to comment really in closing, Tom, that um, there's so many ways, you know, that we're now researching and talking about agency. Um, and in psychology, there's been, uh, you know, a succession of useful ideas that have been tested and explored empirically. Uh, related to self-determination theory and self-efficacy and so on, um, and different ways of, you know, understanding proactivity. And, and, and that one sense is that the, if psychology began really as a kind of control discipline, it's increasingly giving space for the self-determining person, you know, uh, right, the, you know that, that concept is breaking through the limitations of the first concepts of psychology in the early 20th century. And, but what I think is missing in most of this, in most of the work we're doing too now, is a sense of social context and social, and social nestedness. So that we talk about individual characteristics, qualities, agency in all its forms, but we don't have a good language yet for putting that in, uh, for recognizing the fact that everyone is embedded in social relations, that's, mm -hmm. that individuals, individuals are formed through language in social mm -hmm. context, that there's no such thing as the separated uh, separated agency. Agency is always in conjunction with something else. And, you know, the sort of core idea of Confucianism that positions the individual in the larger relational environment was right, you know, on that point. Maybe 
classic Confucianism doesn't give enough room for agency, but it does understand mm -hmm. the social nestedness aspect. So I think we need to be able to do them both. You know, we need to, we need to be able to bring individual a, a capability and agency into the centre of the frame, but we also need to be a lot stronger on understanding it as relational and not separated from society. Um, you know, mm -hmm. the great mistake of Western thought, you know, is that it does that too quickly, too easily, and, 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 and forgets about the social context. And we have to mm -hmm. keep trying to push it back in. Bourdieu, of mm. course, was a great attempt to do that. Um, mm. So, um, you know, really valuable discussion. I, I mean, I, I think maybe we should have a, a whole seminar or seminar series on what is agency and what about and what is agency and structure and what are you know what are the relations and what mediates agency and structure, the sort of Margaret Archer argument and so on. Uh, I just think mm. that's a really productive area of thought at the moment because it frees us from the inequality problem. You know, we can find a space whereby we can begin to overcome structural constraints if we can better understand agency and what it can do and what it can't do. Um, mm. So really, really, really grateful to you for coming on second time and developing that concept more today because it was suggested in your first presentation in the webinar series and it was clearly an important idea and you've now given us more of that. So keep on working on it and we hope to see you back in future. Um, let me say how pleased I was today that for our last webinar in the pre-Northern summer period, we had such good attendance from Asia Pacific. Um, lots of uh, lots of Asia Pacific names in the in the participant list today, and lots of good questions coming from the region. And uh, I mean, Asia Pacific, I suppose, includes East Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, and you know these are really important zones of world of thought now in higher education, with tremendous system development going on in the region. Um, and, 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 you know, I think in future, we'll be able to look back on this period as the time that, you know, Asia, the East Asia, Southeast Asia really came into their global role, uh, which they will enjoy for a very long time to come. Um, you might even say that East Asia holds up half the sky, perhaps, to <laughs> coin a phrase. Uh, it, I think it does intellectually and, and, and perhaps ge geopolitically now. Uh, and India is coming in behind. And, you know, India is becoming more and more important and it's really good to see India and uh, Middle East well represented in our participants again today and in previous webinars this year. Um, uh, we don't get enough participation from Africa, and I really welcome it when I see African names in the um, participant list, but we'd like to have more um, webinars from speakers from Africa. And if you are interested in taking part in a webinar and you're from the region, do get in touch with us. But I think that uh, I can see I can see someone wa hand waving there, um, and, uh, and and you know we our our um, series after the break on colonisation and um, racism in higher education in global higher education is really going to be a good time to start increasing our participation from Africa. We'd like to see more from Latin America, uh, but Latin America is caught by this early start problem. You know the time zone issue as we don't get enough participation from North and South America because of um, the time zone issue, the East Coast of the US and parts of Latin America are better served than others. Um, but um, do come back everyone after the five week break. Um, really look forward to your active participation in, in our showpiece uh, webinar series, eight part series on um, racism and coloniality in global higher education. It's do register for, for the sessions now. It's a tremendous, uh, list of uh, webinars, really interesting, varies a lot in terms of where people are coming from and the topics, no, no repetition within the series. We're hoping to bring out a special journal issue or a book out of the series. And a lot, of course, will be carried by the Q&A uh, by, by, by our participants. It won't just be about papers and presentations. It'll be about discussion. And, you know, these issues are really important to so many people now. And I think it's the time to move forward in relation to racism and decolonization. This is the time to really make gains in that area. And we hope that our, in a small way, our webinar series will contribute. Let me thank Trevor Trehan, who carries this webinar program through his um, technical work, but also through his communications work and his shepherding of people, his encouragement of people and his, his, his um, promotion of the series and every single webinar. I mean, Trevor's absolutely instrumental, operates at a very high level of professionalism, and, uh, and we're very grateful to him. 
And I want to thank all the, the regular participants who come in a lot um, from around the world, but also from Oxford, where we do have excellent participation from my colleagues and students. Uh, and and that, that carries a, a part of our discussion. We'd like to see more people. We'd like to see more discussion. We'd like to see uh, more topics and, and more reach across the world. And we hope that we'll continue to advance the series and the discussion in it um, after the break. So we're all back on the um, 7th of September and then on every Tuesday and Thursday for the rest of two, 2021. Look forward to seeing you then. And thanks again, Tan. Bye for now. Bye-bye.